Well, not too long ago, we did a Remembrances of Sun House and thought it would be a really great idea to continue on that theme and talk to Stefan Grossman about some of the other players that he had contact with. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Mississippi John Hurt. So thanks for taking some oh, time pleasure, to answer Tom. these questions. Pleasure. And the first question is, what was your introduction to Hertz music, and how did you place him in the ranking of players at that time? Harry Smith had put out a, um, at that point, it was a three-volume set on white and black music, um, and almost all my friends, we mm. all bought the, the set. And there was, I think, two tunes by Mississippi John on that. There was Frankie and Spike Driver's Moan, or Strike Dr Spike Driver's Blues. And it was very accessible, Spike Driver's Blues. Really? That is, very accessible in the sense you heard it, you heard that boom chick, the boom chick, and we were all trying to learn how to play guitar in that realm, whether it was Chet Atkins, Merle Travis, and then this new name, Mississippi John Hurt, comes up, and his tunes were a little bit uh, I would say more direct in the sense that you right away you can understand how he was playing them and everyone was playing Spike Driver's Blues <laughs> in the key of G and from there I was fortunate because I was growing up in New York City and I had a lot of friends who were involved with guitar playing as well as involved with blues music per se and we had a group of gentlemen who were older than us who were record collectors so once we discovered a name that we weren't familiar with, or we just became familiar with, like Mississippi John or Charlie Patton or Skip James or whatever, we would give our calls to one, you know, the Bernie Klatsko, Pete Whalen, um, Pete Kaufman, and we would say, hey, do you have any records? And they'd say, come on over. And they were always so gracious. And we'd listen to the other tunes that he recorded at that same 1928 session when he came up to New York City. And all the tunes were great tunes. They're just lovely tunes in the key of C, the key of G, the key of E. And they were tunes that we had to learn. Hmm. So whether it was Lewis Collins, Nobody's Business, and they were just so direct. And you thought, Mississippi John Hurt, he comes from Mississippi, but he certainly doesn't sound like the other Mississippi names we know of, Skip James, Charlie Patton. He sounds more like a Memphis musician Frank Stokes, Furry Lewis, Robert Wilkins. But it was just so immediate. When you hear it, Mississippi John Hurt's old recordings, or even when he was rediscovered, it just right in your face and just lovely to listen to. When you started teaching John Hurt's music, was that prior to seeing him or was that did that come prior later? to seeing oh, him? Oh really? Yeah. Because he came, I think it was rediscovered in sixty three. I was already uh, teaching guitar, uh, teaching students about finger-picking blues probably from 62 or 61. Do you remember what, uh, was it Was it like a lesson that you produced or was it just one-on-one? -on -one? No, they were one-on-one -on -one one lessons. On one. And um, so there'd be a lesson, I would teach someone Lewis Collins, okay. Spike Drivers, I would teach them, um, well, for instance, Avalon Blues was a little difficult to figure out at that time. Uh, Frankie was impossible until I saw Mike Seeger play it at the Philadelphia Folk okay. Festival in the tent. I walked into, I was helping set up the first Philadelphia Folk Festival, and I walked into the tent, and there was Mike in the back of the tent playing Frankie. I said, whoa, how did he figure that out? And I said, what, you're in an open tuning? And mm. he said, yeah, it's open G, and that was like a revelation. Do you remember what the first lesson, as it like a tablature book, or what that one, when that was on Hurt, or when you put that out? Boy, uh, in, I saw it going cross country, and uh, that was the beginning of the guitar workshop okay. because people would want to have, I would give lessons as I was going cross country where people would want to continue them. So I, would, I made a series of tape lessons, reel-to-reel okay. -reel tape lessons. And there were, uh, on the lessons, there were most of the 1928 recordings um, that I had figured out. Did your opinions about him change after seeing him versus just hearing him on the records and meeting him and interacting with him about the way his music, his playing style? Yeah, a lot, because um, when you hear someone on record, you can fantasize on the personality of that sure. person, etc. And on record, he, he, there was a real gentle driving 
feel of his music. But when he was rediscovered, that was something else, absolutely amazing. Number one, we only had uh, maybe 10, 12 tunes that we knew that he recorded, and we could see in the discographies that there were a lot of tunes at the same sessions that were never released. He's rediscovered, and he's playing just like he played in, you know, like 50 years or 30 years at that point prior, 40 years prior. He's just playing fantastically well. And there's all this repertoire is like, goes on and on. There's, I think in total about 80 different tunes, each one with a specific guitar arrangement, which is just like heaven to, for a guitar player. On top of that, he was the sweetest. If you wanted to uh, fantasize on how would you make the perfect granddad mm. for yourself, <laughs> <laughs> no? Mississippi John Hurt was just a wonderful, wonderful person. And he went with the flow, and he was very modest and such a sweet man that everyone just fell in love with him. Mm. He was just charming. And even when there were incidents, like when he was playing at the Gaslight once, there was a southerner, a redneck. And you have to remember, this is in the midst of the civil rights uh, era. And he came in, and he was spewing some terrible southern mm. garbage, you know, racist garbage. And the entourage around John who wanted to protect him, and John just, you know, cool guys, no problem. And then when the guy left, we said, John, I'm, we, you know, apologize. We're up in New York City. We don't expect that type of crap to happen. Mm. And he said a great thing. He said, Stefan, when in Rome, do Rome. <laughs> now, how brilliant is that? And he just would flow with it. At the same time, when the Newport Foundation wanted to give him a guitar, he went to the fretted instrument shop that used to be here in New York City, and he went up, it was on the second floor, and the wall was filled with g Martin guitars, Pearl Martin guitars, Gibson guitars, all these fancy guitars, and he just gravitated to a guild, I think it was an F30, that was, and everyone, his, we were saying, no, get that, you know, 0045 or the, you know, the real fancy Martin, whatever. He just wanted something plain and simple, hmm. you know? And that was, you know, he picked that out, not to be ostent ostentatious wow. at all. Now, you mentioned of all the songs that he had recorded and that you hadn't heard and the stuff that he went on to record, and is that partly due to why he's so much he's so covered more than anybody else really in in the, the workshop catalog because him maybe Reverend Gary Davis is another one that has quite a few lessons devoted to them but John Hurt seems to be pretty much covered the most out of any well any I players. think he's his music that is perfect for people just beginning how to play guitar so you you teach that alternating bass and you have these wonderful songs mm. and he plays in almost every key and every key there's you know something unusual happening you know, a little trick here a little trick there so the tunes and they're short and sweet so they're very good teaching vehicles for a teacher you know at, to give to his students and so the student can work on one song and then that song can lead into another one and you can help the student build up a repertoire and each of the keys that are usually used for finger picking that John played in, you know, A, C, D, E, G, F, no, not too much. And he also played in open tunings, open D and open G. Um, so just a, a perfect repertoire for a teacher to use. So apart from learning his music and teaching his music prior to seeing him perform, and then after meeting him and seeing him perform, did you travel any with him at all? What would happen was, at that point, there was what we, with a smile on our face, called the Blues Mafia. In Boston, New York, LA, San Francisco, there were different, uh, Memphis as well, there were different um, people who were part of this gang, mm -hmm. basically a bunch of nutty kids who were just completely enraptured and completely um, involved with this blues music, country blues guitar, and the music being played. And Tom Hoskins, who had rediscovered John, he um, was an interesting young man, <laughs> to say the least. But what he would ask for was, like he said to me, 
listen, I'm going to be in California. And I said, oh, well, Steve Katz and I, we're going to be in California. It was our first trip that we went cross country. Um, and he said, well, could you take care of John? He actually used the word babysit. Can you babysit for John <laughs> oh, really? for the week? Because he has a week engagement at the Ash Grove, and he can stay at the home the, uh, of, uh, what was his name, Ed Pearls, I think his name was, who owned the Ash Grove. So we said, sure, and Steve could drive. I couldn't drive. So we were in Berkeley. We flew down to L.A., and we spent the whole week with John living together. And, of course, I was learning lots of tunes from him, and he was you know, very uh, easy about whatever I'd ask. He'd oh, teach. Really? Yeah. Wow. Or if I would play, if he'd hear me play a tune like Big Road Blues, the next thing, now that's not a John Hurt type of tune, but the next thing he would be playing a tune similar. Uh, in fact, it, it was the first time I heard him play an open D, and it was If You Don't Want Me, Babe. Oh, wow. you know? And it, the same lyrics were used as in Big Road Blues. And then at one point I was learning a Frank Stokes tune about Spider, Spider up on the wall. Mm. And John said, oh, I play that. And he played that tune. Wow. You know, so all of a sudden all these tunes were coming out, you know, by being one-on-one -on -one with him. All these tunes that we didn't even know that we, he wasn't playing them in concert. Because okay. he did have a, a set, a bunch of tunes that were very popular in concert. And so then we started to say, wow, there's a well there. There's so many tunes. And he would um, you know, be very show willing to show them to us. And he, at that point also, I remember he was giving Steve advice, because Steve was, a, he was uh, uptight because he thought this girlfriend he had up in Berkeley might be pregnant and his whole life would, I mean, remember, we were like 17 or 18. Sure. His whole life was going to be changed, and John was giving him advice on what to do. I mean. <laughs> The perfect granddad. What was, uh, if you had to pick one or two songs of Hertz that are your, your favorite, what, what, what are they and, and why? Boy, you know, I, usually when I pick up the guitar, the first tune I'll play is uh, Nobody's Business and oh, really? John's version of it, yeah. My Creole Bell, which was a march and mm. two-step, which he just took, you know, one part of that. Uh, it's such a lovely tune to sing with an audience and the audience is always know it. Um, blues in A, when he, he does that's a coffee blues, Okay. you know, just terrific. I love playing, once he showed me the, the A position up the neck that he used in Avalon Blues, just sitting down and playing an E, you know, a la Mississippi John Hurts, great. Were they songs that you had really enjoyed prior to knowing him, or was it kind of after being with him and they have a special connection with him, or are they just because just they're great they're just songs? just great melodies, okay. you know, what beats a you know, good melody, nothing. Right. And he had tunes, lots of tunes with great melodies. When it came time for him to record for Vanguard, and there was a little bit of a, a legal craziness going on with the people who had rediscovered him and had signed him up for this contract, that, there was some crazy legal stuff. Mm -hmm. But once that got sort of resolved to a certain degree, um, he was being recorded here at the Vanguard Studios, which was a big, it was in a hotel with a big ballroom. And John was there, and I, at that point, had an OM45 Martin guitar from 1930. So I said, you know, John, you really should use this because it records like a dream. So he used that guitar. The session itself was interesting because John was a little intimidated by the surroundings. And a person that he really uh, could not identify, but um, communicate with more than us Northerners, because here we were these these white kids who you know, <laughs> were at his feet. You know, we just thought, wow. And he, you know, imagine for him coming from being a sharecropper and all of a sudden coming up playing in colleges with all these people who are just in love with him. Right. Whereas down south, you can imagine. He felt somewhat intimidated in the studio, but the person that he could really hang out with and relax the most was Pat Skye. Oh. So Pat Skye would sat down in front of the mics with Mississippi John, and he played on one or two of the tunes, mm. but he was just there with John. And I think he told um, Maynard Solomon, the head of Vanguard, who was up in the control booth, said, just tell all these people that, you know, piss off. You know, Right. Leave the room. Leave alone. Just me, you know, me and John will hang out with some whiskey and 
No, that's fine. Wow. And so that's the sessions, which was at the end of the day, there were three records. All, they were all recorded at the right. same session. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing that I, I've always wondered about, especially with Mississippi John Hurt, is some of the live recordings. And I, I was wondered what it must have been like for him to come from the South and up there. And then there's this, I mean, the, the thunder of applause. Did that ever throw him, or did it? Who was, knows? Did he, he we, never mentioned anything about. Well, I mean, we I, were what going to say, but I don't know. But no, but we were all so. I don't. I can use the word stupid or insensitive. <laughs> we were just. These are legends coming oh, sure. to life, and these are the guitar plays that we want to learn how to play. When I say we, and I'm say these, these being Sunhouse, Skip James, Bucko mm. White. You know, these guys from a completely different. A tradition, a different culture. It's like a different planet. Mm. And now they're coming up north and traveling all over the world to Europe, etc., being performing to not um, 20 people in the juke joint, but to 2,000 people with all white faces. Right. And you could hear a pin drop, and they're just clapping their hands, you know, encore after encore. Nobody really asked them how it, you know, how, it felt. how you do it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. well, how, you know, psychologically, because we weren't into that. We were into, you know, keep playing, teach us more. We want to hear more music. Right. Well, I'm sure for him in particular, because, you know, I know some of the guys that were in the rediscovery didn't necessarily have the same guitar ability as they did to their early recordings, yeah. but John Hurt played very, True to some of the some of his John Hurt was recordings. really his chops were right. Right. I, when Tom found him, he had I think not been playing the guitar for quite a few years, oh, really? and I actually have the recording uh, that Tom did because as he was knocking at the door, and John was reluctant to open the door because he thought he was a a tax man, <laughs> a tax man meaning that John was had bootleg you know, was a bootlegger, and he was afraid that th those uh, government officials, were, this Tom was one of those, um, but within a couple of 30, 40 minutes, once Tom's in the house, John picks up Tom's guitar and he starts to pick. He's a little rusty, a little rusty, but then you can start to hear it. Within a couple of months, he's you know, knocking him out, boy. Wow. He's playing as well as he did play, mm -hmm. as fast as he played, as accurately as he played. I mean, that was very unusual because none of Really, none of the other musicians that were rediscovered, I would say, had the magic um, that they had from their earlier recordings. Sure. You know, they, they had a, there was something great about them, emotional, and, and it was very interesting, but they didn't have that really genius. The genius mm -hmm. had sort of left for whatever reason. Usually it was because they hadn't played guitar for years and years. Right, yeah. Now at that time with all the other artists being rediscovered and the festivals and them intermingling with each other um, and wide variety of personalities amongst all of them, is there any time that you can think of when John Hurt was with, say, you know, Skip James or Son House, anything? Yeah, it was sort of interesting. I remember a couple of times. One was at my, I had to pick up Ed Denson. Ed was involved with Tacoma Records as well as Kicking Mule Records. but. He was involved with um, John Fahey, and they were sort of taking care of when Skip James and Bucka White had just been rediscovered, they were taking care of them as, quote, managers, agents. And Ed was traveling with Son, Skip, and John Hurt. And f for some reason, they were coming to New York City at Penn Station, and the train was arriving at, I think, at like 1.30 in the morning. And I was at Cooper Union School of Architecture, and I was doing a, an all-night project. And so I said, well, I'll meet you, and they can you know, come to, I was living with my parents at that time, and they can come to my parents' house, and you can just hang out there. And then I think at six or seven, um, Ed had to take Skip and John to, down to Washington, and Son was still at the house, and then he was gonna be picked up by someone else and, and be taken somewhere to some other place. But when they came, when I finally found them, because I said, well, we'll meet you at Penn Station, forgetting that there are different corners at Penn oh. Station. <laughs> so I went to all the corners. <laughs> so about 2 o'clock, I found them. 
took him down to the house, and my parents had a, a wall, which was just the library, full of books. So we were sitting at the table, and Mississippi John is just, I put some whiskey on the table, and everyone's just very low-keyed, knowing that they really couldn't go to sleep. They had to stay up to catch that early morning train. Skip right away, just looking at all the books. Really? He just got up, and he's just looking at all the books and detached. And where his son, he just wanted to drink and drink and drink, and after that, drink and drink and drink <laughs> some more, if he could. And John was just ordinary, you know, moderation, and just sitting there. Wow. You know? I think there was a little, I think Skip thought of John being a little bit Uncle Tomish because the, John could go with the flow. Mm where Skip was really, he didn't like white people. You know, and you can imagine he had lots of reasons oh, not absolutely. to like. And whereas someone like Sun House, he also went where he was told, but mm. he never really saw Sun's personality, whereas John's personality carried on his sleeve and he shared it with everybody. You know?